Let's go over how to apply Gauss's law to an infinite cylinder of charge. And we'll see that there are similarities with the infinite line of charge, but there are also a few differences that need to be pointed out. First of all, an infinite cylinder of charge, just like an infinite line of charge, does not exist in practice. It's an idealization. However, as long as we're looking to find the electric field at a point pretty close to the surface of a very long cylinder, we can consider the cylinder to be infinite even though it's not and the error that we make in doing so is reasonably small. So we do have to learn how to find the electric field created by an infinite cylinder of charge by applying Gauss's law. Now in terms of similarities, we also have the fact that the symmetry is the same, and therefore that we have an electric field that is radially outward if the cylinder is positively charged, or radially inward if the cylinder is negatively charged. The difference with the line of charge is that the cylinder actually has a volume and has charge distributed throughout its volume. Therefore, we have volume charge density rho, positive or negative, and not linear charge density. But when it comes to the electric field lines and the symmetry of the electric field, we find the same radially outward or radially inward symmetry. Another difference is that because the cylinder has a volume again, we have two regions of space. We have inside the cylinder and outside the cylinder. I typically label them one and two. Inside region one, there's a certain electric field, and we have no reason to assume that it's the same expression as the electric field in region two, and therefore we treat the two regions separately. We start with region one, and we work our way out typically. So let's start with region one, and let's recognize that because the electric field is radial, just like the infinite line of charge, we're going to use a Gaussian cylinder of radius little r, which is less than big R, the radius of the actual cylinder, and length L. And the electric field is going to be such that there will be no flux through the top or the bottom surfaces of the cylinder because the electric field is radially outward and therefore perpendicular to dA1 and dA3 everywhere. However, through the lateral surface of my Gaussian cylinder, there is going to be outward flux because everywhere the electric field has the same magnitude and the same direction, which is the same direction as dA2, the normal to the lateral surface. Now it's hard to see maybe in this drawing, but much easier to see down here where if we draw dA2 for the lateral surface, we can see that everywhere we look, the electric field is going to be along dA2, and that therefore that's the only surface that's going to matter when it comes to calculating flux. So let's compute the flux, and it's going to be very similar to the case of the infinite line of charge. So the flux through the entire closed cylinder is going to be equal to the flux through the top surface, which is not closed, so we won't put a ring around the integrals. E cosine of the angle between E and dA1 times dA1, while the angle is 90, and cosine of 90 is 0, which gives us no flux through the top of the cylinder. Then we have flux through the lateral surface, E cosine of the angle between E and dA2, which is 0, multiplied by dA2. And then, let's make a little bit of room, put this here. We're going to have the same integral as over A1, just for A3, for the bottom part of the cylinder. So for the bottom surface, E cosine of 90 dA3. And that's going to be 0, because cosine of 90 is 0, as expected. No flux through the top or the bottom of the cylinder just flux through the lateral side, and everywhere on the lateral surface, electric field is constant in magnitude because every point of that surface is a distance little r from the center of the axis of the cylinder of charge. So E times the integral, this cosine of 0 is 1, over A2 of dA2 just gives us E times the surface area, which is 2 pi RL, as we discussed in the case of the infinite line of charge.
This then needs to be equated to Q enclosed over epsilon naught, where Q enclosed is the amount of charge that lives within our Gaussian cylinder. Well, our Gaussian cylinder is smaller than the actual cylinder, so it doesn't capture all of the charge. It captures a fraction of it, and the fraction that it captures is going to be rho, the charge per volume, multiplied by the volume of the red cylinder, which is pi little r squared l, divided by epsilon naught. And therefore, by Gauss's law, we can set the two quantities equal. We can say that E, I'm actually going to call it E1 for region 1, 2 pi r l is equal to rho pi little r squared l divided by epsilon naught. One of the little r's cancels, pi cancels, L cancels, but we expected that because we have an infinitely long cylinder, so it shouldn't be a function of L. Everywhere you look, you should see the same thing. And ultimately, we find that the electric field in region 1, which is within the cylinder of charge, is equal to rho r over 2 epsilon naught in magnitude. And if you want the vector, you can just add an arrow above E1 and add R hat. So it would be E1 vector is rho R over 2 epsilon naught carried by R hat. Note that this expression is only valid for little r smaller than big R. So it's only true in region 1. We still have to do region 2. It's going to be similar, but we're going to find actually a different expression of the electric field. And depending on the region that you're considering in the problem, you have to use the proper expression of the electric field. Now, you don't add them or anything like that. Each region has its own electric field, and you have to use the appropriate expression. So here this is inside the cylinder of charge. Let's now look at what we get when we do the same thing in region 2. Now, to be in region 2, we need to take our Gaussian cylinder and actually make it bigger than the actual cylinder. Because remember, you always find the electric field on your Gaussian surface. And so if you want to find the electric field in region 2, then your Gaussian surface has to exist in region 2. So similar arguments, because nothing has really changed. We've just made the cylinder bigger. But in terms of flux, we will get no flux through the end caps, we will only get flux through the lateral surface, the lateral wall of the cylinder. And that's simply because we have, again, a radially outward, in this case, electric field. And so it turns out that for the same reasons as previously, the electric flux through the cylinder is going to be the same. It's not going to change. The flux itself doesn't actually know that you're computing flux in region 1 or in region 2. It only cares about the fact that you're computing flux through a cylinder. So I'm not going to skip any steps here because it's the first time we're doing it, but you could just skip to the chase and say, well, the flux is the same. There's the same number of field lines that go through the smaller Gaussian cylinder than go through the larger Gaussian cylinder. But just to be thorough, let's very quickly run through this and say that the flux through the entire Gaussian cylinder is going to be equal to the sum of the flux through the top, through the side, and through the bottom. So A1E cosine of 90 dA1, that's zero. Then we have flux through the lateral wall. A2, so E cosine of 0, dA2, and then plus 0 flux through the bottom, same as the top. And going a little quicker than before, we find the exact same flux, E times 2 pi RL. So the flux doesn't change, and that's typically true in all these problems. You're going to find the same flux in region 1 and region 2. What's going to change is the amount of charge enclosed, because now you have a bigger cylinder. 
However, be careful not to go too fast here. Because the most common mistake that I see is students taking rho, the charge per volume, and then multiplying by the volume of the Gaussian cylinder, arguing that you should multiply by pi r squared l, because that's what we did before anyway, and it seems to make sense to multiply rho by volume. Well, true, but you're overcounting charge here, because you're taking the volume, including this space here between your Gaussian cylinder and the true cylinder of charge. And there is no charge in that region. There's only charge actually on the actual physical cylinder of charge that has a radius big R. And now you've enclosed all of that cylinder. So you can only claim that the charge enclosed is going to be rho multiplied by this time pi big R squared L because that's the true volume of the physical cylinder of charge. So by Gauss's law, you now get a different expression. You're going to find that the two quantities, let's call this E2 for region 2, times 2 pi RL, is equal to rho pi big R squared L divided by epsilon naught. We still find that L cancels as it should. We have an infinite cylinder. The answer should not depend on L. Pi goes away, but that's about it when it comes to simplifications. Therefore, E2 is equal to rho big R squared divided by 2 epsilon naught little r. And this is the expression of the electric field that is valid in region 2, in other words, outside of your cylinder of charge. And again, if you want the vector form, you can write it E is equal to the magnitude rho capital R squared over 2 epsilon naught r carried by r hat. Therefore, we have two different expressions of the electric field, one for region 1, one for region 2. And if we were to graph this, we wanted to represent the magnitude of the electric field as a function of the radial distance little r, then we'd have to distinguish region 1 and region 2. In other words, we'd have to make apparent the fact that at some point you reach the radius big R of your physical cylinder, and that's the limit between the inside and the outside. And so on the left, you have region 1, on the right, you have region 2. And recall that E1 that we found earlier is rho r over 2 epsilon naught. Now, this is interesting because what it tells you is that in region 1, the electric field is directly proportional to the radial distance little r. So when r is 0, E1 is 0. And then eventually, when little r is equal to big R, you just substitute big R in here, and you find that E is equal to rho big R over 2 epsilon naught. Now, it turns out if you plug big R into this expression, you find the same value. So the electric field E2 starts out here, but now E2 is actually proportional to 1 over little r, because the top here, rho big R squared, is actually constant. And so you get an electric field that dies off as 1 over r. So E2 is proportional to 1 over r, whereas E1 is actually directly proportional to little r. They kind of make sense. They actually completely make sense. If you increase little r in region 1, you enclose more of the actual cylinder that carries charge. More charge means stronger electric field. Once you reach the border of your actual cylinder of charge, well, you can make the Gaussian cylinder bigger if you want. You're not going to enclose any more charge. And so then your electric field starts to die off as 1 over r. Thanks for watching this video. At Congress Academy, we create custom study guides so that you don't have to. Send us your syllabus and some old exams, and we'll put together lecture notes, practice problems with step by step solutions, and classic exam questions so that you don't waste your time. 
All you have to do is log in and focus on studying what matters most. And if you have questions, we're available to help. If you'd like to learn more about how Cogris Academy can help you do well, check us out at cogrisacademy.com. We look forward to helping you. See you there.